Good morning, DCN. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. Uh, many of you have been asking me, how, how are you doing, Elisha? How are you doing? And uh, some of you might be wondering how, how I'm doing. <laughs> Just in case you're wondering, uh, I'm, I'm doing well by God's grace. He is sustaining me. He is sustaining our body. He is still dreaming for our church. And we want to see his dreams realized among us in this body, in this region, in this nation, and beyond. And it's, it's amazing to experience that kind of God power in me, God power in us, as I meet with you, as I talk to you, I sense that hope is rising. Hope is rising. Hashtag hope is rising. Hashtag DCN. Hashtag God is on the move. He is with us. He is God Emmanuel. And I just want to reassure you that I am all in and we are all in. Amen? Amen. 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 We need to record this. <laughs> we are all in to the mission that God has for us. And it's amazing. Would you turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Habakkuk? Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14 to 20 is our text for this morning. Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14 to 20. I've nicknamed Habakkuk what? Hugs and Squeeze. Good job, Alex. Thank you. Hugs and Squeeze uh, because his name means to embrace and his name means to wrestle. So with that heart of hugs and squeeze, as you're finding Habakkuk, give your neighbor a hug and a squeeze, please, to your left and to your right, and say, Jesus loves you, hugs and squeeze, amen, amen. We are blessed to be together. We are blessed to be a family of God. If you have found the text for today, please say amen. amen. And may I ask you to rise with me as I read God's word. Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors, pouring it from the wineskin till they are drunk so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. You will be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it is your turn. Drink and be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around to you, and disgrace will cover your glory. The violence you have done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, and your destruction of animals will terrify you. For you have shed man's blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Of what value is an idol, since a man has carved it, or an image that teaches lies? For he who makes it trusts in his own creation. He who makes, he makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life, or to lifeless stone, wake up. Can it get guidance? It is covered with gold and silver. There is no breath in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Glorious Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of being in your presence. Would you help us to silence our hearts before you so that we may hear from you? Lord, I need to hear from you. We need to hear from you. Speak to us, Lord, for your servants are listening. And in the name of Jesus, I bind the schemes of the enemy that is trying to distract, that is trying to speak evil and condemnation into our hearts. We only ask that your angels and archangels defend us 
so that we may truly worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If any of you are taking notes, today's message is, let all the earth be silent before him. Can we say that together? Let all the earth be silent before him. Let all the earth be silent before him. I've spent this week meditating on this word. Let all the earth, and I'm a part of the earth, and I wanted to live out this word, to be silent before him. So in my times of sermon preparation, I spent time just sitting down, opening my uh, arms like this, and, and saying, Lord, I'm, I'm going to be silent before you. Speak, for your servant is listening. And you know what? Every time I try to be silent, something pops up in my head. I need to fold the laundry. I need to do the dishes. I need to go pick up Leo. I need to do this. I need to do that. And just I, I desired silence, yet what came back was noise. Noise upon noise upon noise. And then, you know, I, I tried to be silent by maybe, you know, just checking the world news on the internet. And then the world news is not very silent at all. It's very noisy. Every, every news I, I read, it's, it's violence, there's hatred, there's anger, there's frustration. So not much silence there either. But there is one place that I did find silence and it was this place. Whenever you think of me and whenever you pray for me, can you kind of picture this place? Because this is where I pray. I, I look to the cross. Uh, by the way, I don't pray to this thing here. It's just, uh, <laughs> just an ornament. I, I pray <laughs> underneath the cross. And this is where I kneel. And this is where I pray for each one of you. I go through this room. Because some of you are people of habit. And you sit in the same places, <laughs> which makes it very easy for me to just think about where you sit, and I pray for you. And as I'm praying, and as I'm thinking about you, God gives me that peace and that silence, because he is listening, and he is pleased. He wants us to pray. He wants us to be with him. It's not much about doing, but it's about being. And this notion of silence, this idea of silence is about being, being with him. Many of you have an idea of what a good Christian looks like. A good Christian dresses well on Sunday mornings, just like I'm doing. Thank you, Sarah, my wife. A good Christian reads at least five chapters of the Bible a day, at least. A good Christian prays before meals, and a good Christian does all these things, and you have a checklist. And you check this, you check that. And sometimes at the end of the day, you find out the checkboxes have not been checked for some odd reason or the other. And then you go into guilt mode and shame mode and feeling like I am less of a Christian. Today I'm here to say to you that God wants you to be silent before him, which means he wants you to be with him. You don't necessarily, well, reading the Bible is good, praying is good, evangelizing is good. All that's good. I encourage that. But if we lose the heart of what God is requiring of us, then we're missing out. And I don't want you to miss out. Just like me, I've had this urge to obey the word. But as I kneel before the Father, he is giving me grace and he will give you the grace as well. Even as you're driving, please don't close your eyes when you're driving and you're praying. <laughs> Open your eyes and, and pray, Lord, I want to see you today. I want to see your glory today. I want to see the living God today. I want to see you working in my life today. That's the being that God is requiring of us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Since last week, we've been learning about the five worlds that God is saying to the people of Babylon. These are really violent, bad people, bad guys. Habakkuk cries out to God in chapter 1 and says, How long? Why God? And God says, I'm going to send you more violence. And that's the Babylonians. In chapter 2, uh, Habakkuk says, I will stand at my watch in faith. And God says, I will bring five woes 
to the Babylonians. Last week, we studied woe one, woe two, woe three. Today, we'll go to woe four and woe. Excellent. Verse 14, let's begin there. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Glory is heavy. Glory is weighty. And he wants to cover us just like the waters cover the sea. It would be very intriguing if the sand covered the seas. Can you even imagine that? Not the waters covering the seas, but the sand was covering. It doesn't work like that. God made it that way so that the waters cover the sea. And water, again, has a very close link with the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. But also the water, the washing of the water, means the word of God as well. So the word of God and the Holy Spirit together will cover us will transform us. And with that in mind, let's go to woe number four, verse 15. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors, pouring it from the wineskin till they are drunk so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. You will be filled with shame instead of glory. Woe number four is people trying to get you to do evil things. People trying to get you to do things that you really don't want to do. And let me illustrate this. My first day of secondary school in Manchester, United Kingdom. Steve, you'll, you'll appreciate this. Um, first day. And I had graduated primary school, top of my class. And my dad was proud of me. My mom was proud. I was proud of myself. And secondary school is my next step. And I wanted to make a difference. And I wanted to be liked. And I wanted to just do things well. Standing in front of my first science class, uh, people that were in my class, they weren't really my friends yet because it was my first day. But I wanted to make a good impression. And they were saying, go on, Elisha. Kick the door. You know, kick the door. And I'm like, well, why should I kick the door? But they're like, you know, go on, kick the door, kick the door. And I didn't want to. I really didn't. But they kept on asking me. They, they kept on not only asking, but they kept on encouraging me. Not only encouraged, but they kept on pushing me. Oh, and then this really worked. They dared me. <laughs> I bet you can't do that, Elisha. You can't kick the door. So what did I do? I kicked the door. So the door was behind me, and I kicked the door like this. Bang! Hoping that the science teacher wasn't in the room. But to find out, the science teacher comes out and says, who kicked the door? And all of my so-called friends pointed at me. So I got called in, and, he, and the science teacher told me very sternly, you stand here. And I still remember that experience to this day. I was so embarrassed. I was so not in my place. But I wanted to be liked, so I just did what they pushed me to do. Have you ever been in that peer pressured atmosphere before? Any of you? Any of you? Okay, so I'm not the only one. It was embarrassing. That wasn't really me. Well, of course, being a first-year secondary school student, I was quite insecure, and I wanted to please people. And, and my identity in Christ wasn't as solid as it is now, and it will be in the future. But when people push you to do things, it creates havoc, doesn't it? I've been hearing of the news, the, the opioid crisis of overdoses in our area alone. It's heartbreaking. People are dying left and right. And I wonder if they tried, they, they tried by their own will. You know, they, they wanted to try drugs or if it was pushed to them. Many a times it was pushed to them by drug pushers. But what if it's our own kids, our relatives, our cousins, no less? who are pushed into this addiction and pushed towards overdoses. It creates not only havoc, but so much pain, death. 
It's not right. It's not right. And God is not pleased with that. And that's what God is saying. Because the Babylonians were pushing things upon other people, like drinking wine or alcohol. Just have a drink. Here you go. And they drink it. Oh, I bet you can't drink another one. So they drink another one. And I I dare you to drink the third one. So they drink it. And and they kept on pushing, 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 until that they just lost all control of their will and self-control. And they just did awful things, sinful things, as a matter of fact. And God is not pleased. And God says this, you will be filled with shame instead of glory. So this is the question to you this morning. Do you want to be filled with shame or do you want to be filled with glory? Glory. Amen? It's not only for the Babylonians, it's also a message for us. Are we pushing others into evil? Maybe we overtly do it or covertly do it. But sometimes, if a person is in need right now, and you just walk by, you are not influencing them in the goodness that God wants you to. If you see someone in need, you stop for the one. And you love the one. And you say, hey man, how can I pray for you? Are you hungry? Can I take you out to McDonald's or something? Hey, listen. Listen. God loves you, man. Jesus loves you. I love saying this to the people uh, at, at the supermarket. You know, you know how people at, at the counters, the checkouts, they have the most remarkably non-facial expressions. It's like, dig. And I look them straight in the eye and I say, how are you doing today? Are you having a good day? You are doing an awesome job. You didn't miss one item. You got all of them in. You're doing so good. And then at the end I say, Jesus loves you, man. And they're like, okay, thank you. Next. You know? <laughs> but still, but still, I want to be uh, used by God. He wants to use you in that way. Not for evil, pushing evil, but we want to be good. Good. Righteousness. Holiness. Joy. Peace. And even if they're taking a long time to do it, be patient with them. Listen. Be patient with them. It's okay. It's okay. By God's grace. So God is saying there will be judgment on you. You'll be filled with shame instead of glory. And you'll be exposed. Because the cup from the Lord's right hand, verse 16, is coming around to you. And disgrace will cover your glory. This is another way that God is saying that he is just. Do we believe in a just God today? He is just. And I believe that his perfect justice and his perfect love, it collides at the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's the God whom we serve this morning. Because his justice and his perfect love met and there was a sacrifice that was given. We ought to have had and paid for our lives that sacrifice. There was no other way. But by God's love and great love and great mercy, God sent his one and only son. If somebody stepped into my line of sight and took the bullet for me that was coming my way, I would be grateful. But your eternal life has been paid in full and your sins have been forgiven because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Yes, there is woe for the unrighteous. That's true. That's the justice of God. But he doesn't leave us there. He provides Jesus the way, the truth, and the life for no one can come to the Father except through Jesus. And I'm so glad that we know him, that we are loved by him. And then God goes on to say, verse 18, of what value is an idol since a man has carved it or an image that teaches lies? For he who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life or to lifeless stone. Wake up. Can it give guidance? It is covered with gold 
and silver. There is no breath in it. Breath in the original text is ruach. And if you've been here with us for a couple of years or a couple of months, you may remember that this means the wind, but also the Holy Spirit. There is no life in idols. I've been thinking about idols too this week. How many of you have an idol at home and you bow down to it and you worship it like this? You know, I, I bow down to you, idol, and idol, I want you to do this for me. And idol, you know, I, I just need you to get me a brand new job. I need you to get me a promotion. I need you to do this. I need you to get my children into the best school that they can go to so that they can get a good job and they can have a great life. And idol, I need a brand new house, by the way. Idol, I need that brand new car. And idol, I need that brand new iPhone. I'm not going to buy that. But I, I need that because I'm going to ask you for it. How many of you do that at home? Any of you? Have an idol at home, like Buddha, or I don't know, a carved image made out of wood, Pinocchio, you know, anyone? <laughs> anyone? We, we really don't have idols, not in, in this culture. Uh, but we do have idols in our hearts. We do have things that we worship in our hearts. And maybe God is talking to you today. Because God does not want us to worship idols because God knows the consequences of worshiping idols. There's no life. Idols can't save you. So in the Babylonian days, they had lots of, lots of idols. And I, I, I researched some names of them. The god of the sky was El, his wife Ishtar. The god of the ground was Baal or Marduk. His wife was Ninlil. And all these idols and names, and they worshipped these idols. They worshipped it. God of the sky, God of the ground, God of fertility, all of these things. Oh yeah, give me this, give me that, give me this, give me that. But you know what? Do you know what idolatry is in a biblical sense? I'll break it down into three things, okay? A person, firstly, worships the image, okay? And secondly, eventually the person becomes like the image. And thirdly, and oftentimes, the image destroys that person. Again, first thing, a person worships an image, eventually becomes like that image, and eventually the image destroys the person. So, illustration. From my own failures. I mean, the first one, kicking the door, that was embarrassing, but this one, again. Back in the day, maybe about 10 years ago, I was serving the military, and I had some time on my hands. And I borrowed some money, maybe about $30,000 or something like that. And I went into the stock market. What did I know about the stock market? Nothing. <laughs> what did I know? Well, I knew that my friends were kind of doing it. So I said, hey, are there any good stocks? And they're like, this, this, and this. I'm like, no research. Don't do this. No research, no idea, but just on the, the word of my friends, I bought the stocks. $30,000 worth. You may think that is very S-T-U-P-I-D. Uh, and I think that too. I mean, it's embarrassing. But I did. But you know what happened? Every day I would go in to the stock market and check if there was a red line. What, what's the other color? Green. Green? Okay. Or, bl or blue? Up and down, right? It's always up and down. It's always up and down. So when it was going up, I was like, yay! And I had, I had come to a point where I had about $100,000 worth of sock, stocks and, and above. And I'm thinking, I'm going to buy this for my parents. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. It's not realized money until you cash it out. That's what I found. But in my head, I'm rich! 
I have $100,000 in my account. And I'm like, yay, it's so good. So I'm riding this wave. I'm going up high. But every time it goes down, what happens? My emotions go down. Yep, I have no, I, I don't want to eat because I've, I've lost money. It goes, fluctuates to 80,000, then back to 120,000, and back to 50,000. It was driving me insane. To some point, I couldn't work anymore. I was sitting in front of my computer, staring at the screen, up and down. Oh, no, no. Oh, no. Yeah, it's, I'm like a madman. A madman, I tell you. That's what I was... Until I found out that was my idol. I was worshipping money. I was worshipping the stock market. Up and down. And it led me good. It led me up. It led me down. Until finally, I lost a lot of money. And I still owe my mom $10,000. And I'm still trying to pay it back. But I lost everything. The moral of the story is don't do that. Okay? <laughs> That's the moral of the story. But the real spiritual aspect is idol worship can come to you and it can look good because I had good intentions at the beginning. I wanted to make money so that I could buy my dad a brand new car. That was my goal. Good intentions. But then the image led me to become like this, up and down, up and down. No stability. And at the end, it crashed on me. It crashed on me. Now for those who... Uh, invest in the stock market and you're studying it and you're professionals, that's okay, do it. But don't do it like me, okay? But it's not just that. Good things can become idols really quickly. I've seen and experienced and walked with families that put children as their idols. They love them, of course, as we should. They raise them well, as they should. But they put all their hopes in their children's achievements. So if they do not perform to the level that you want them to, then you go down. If they perform well, you go up. Isn't that interesting? Up and down, up and down. The good thing is our living God our gracious God, our heavenly Father, the living God, he does not fluctuate. He is steadfast in his love and commitment to you and to me through the word of God and by his spirit. Would you rather not trust in the one who is so true that will never lie to you, that will never leave you nor forsake you, I'm coming to the understanding by God's grace that worshipping idols is really not worth it. It's energy badly spent. And that's why God says don't do it. The first and second commandment. Let's turn to Exodus together. Exodus. Let's see what God says about idols. Okay? <clears throat> Let's see what God says in Exodus. Chapter 20, verse 1 to 6. Exodus, chapter 20, verse 1 to 6. I love hearing the Bible pages turning, and I encourage you to bring your Bibles. Bring your Bibles. Take it everywhere with you. Exodus, chapter 20. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. Punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Amen. 
If you are struggling with an idol this morning in your life, whether it be such a good thing, but you're pouring your heart to this idol, let me assure you, your idol will not deliver. Let me assure you, your idol will not give you everlasting life. Let me assure you this morning that God says no to idols. Verse 19 of Habakkuk. Let's come back to Habakkuk. Chapter 2, 19. Woe to him who says to word, come to life, or to lifeless stone, wake up, can it give guidance? It is covered with gold and silver. Now listen, idols will look nice on the outside. It's covered with gold, it's covered with silver. There is no breath in it, no life in it. So let me give you a choice. Would you rather serve an idol that has no life, or would you serve and be loved by a king that is living and active. Let's go to verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. This means our God is living, our God is breathing, our God is sustaining, he is creating, he is redeeming, he is sanctifying, he is healing, he is delivering, he is freeing. And he continues to do that to this day. I had a revelation this week in my times of silence where I actually got to be silent and still. That Wow, the God we read about in the Bible, he's the same God today. Okay, maybe you knew this and I didn't. <laughs> but I, I look through these pages. The God of Abraham is the same God today. The God who led the Israelites out of bondage and slavery from Egypt is the same today. The God who made the Red Sea part and the people walked through it. That God is the same today. It's remarkable. It's remarkable. And we get an opportunity to, to share that God with other people. And we see that God in Jesus, in the flesh, in the New Testament. He healed people's eyes. He raised people from the dead. What's impossible in your life this morning? Is it trying to pay your mortgage? Is it trying to find the, the right spouse? For those singles out there, Josh, pray for your spouse. <laughs> A godly spouse. Amen? 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 Come on, godly spouse. What's the impossible? Like your children who you've raised in the church but don't want anything to do with the church now? What's the impossible? Let me remind you, our God has no impossible in his dictionary. He is able to save, to deliver, and to heal. And that's why we look to him. You're right. For me, as a pastor, I am going through a tough time. Suddenly, these responsibilities, which I didn't recognize before, are mine. Oh, that's yours. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, you need to. Oh, yep. That, that's me too. Yep. Uh, oh, by the way. The, oh, yes. Whew. There's a lot. But you know where I see the grace of God? is that when I pray in my spot, and again, please remember me as you pray for me, being here, kneeling down, this is what I do. I, I kneel down here. I'm giving you a vit, uh, uh, an image so that you can remember me. I pray, and sometimes I lift up my hands and I say, God, help. God, help us. 
you know that your servant cannot do this. And I cry out to God. And in those times, there's an overwhelming sense of calm and peace that God grants me. And when I share some of these things with the people that I meet, and I say, listen, you know what? I, I'm, I'm not a social network guru. I, I just don't know how to do it. And then a brother like Keith comes up to me and says, hey, just give me the, the ID and password. Let me do that for you. I'm like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> and I say to people, like, I don't know how to do this very well. Can you help me? And especially like with the finances of the church, and I sat down with Bob, our treasurer, bless his heart he sat with me for two hours and then he worked on the financials and i'm like thank you lord and i'm seeing god moving in our body i'm seeing it why because i can't do it but what i can do is what habakkuk says in chapter 2 verse 1 i will stand at my watch and I will look to see what God will do. Remember this, your pastor is praying for you. When I reach out to you, don't think it's because that's my job. It's because the Lord puts you on my heart. Elisha, you need to reach out to this person today. Elisha, you need to meet this person today. Your pastor is praying for you. And I believe God is, has given us an opportunity like no time before. For us to live the word of God. Verse 20, again, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Yes, he is. He is among us. He is moving. He's alive. Our response is this. Let all the earth be silent before him. So this, I want you to remember. If you forget everything, that's okay. Remember this. Let all the earth be silent before him in three words. Is Rush to hush. Everyone say, rush to hush. The imperative and emphatic word silent in the Hebrew literally means to hush. And in this season of Thanksgiving, Christmas and beyond, we need to rush to hush. Everyone say it again. Rush to hush and see what God does through you. We live in a rushed world. Yes, indeed. So we're going to move from rushing to hushing. Yes. But also we need to move fast towards hush. Being silent, being still before him, listening to him, receiving guidance from him, receiving wisdom from him, so that we don't go our own way, but go God's way. And I'm convinced when we sit silent, before our God, he will do some amazing things. Don't think of yourselves as being part of a small church. I, I really don't like that phrase. We're a church that has a vision, and I want to see God's dream be realized. And I'll share more as the weeks go by of what God has for us. Remember this. We need to rush to hush and listen to his voice. And until he does, we will not move as a church body. And I know God has mighty things in store. Let's pray. Father God, you will judge the unrighteous. We see the woes. And that's true, Lord. But your perfect love and your perfect justice collides at the cross of Jesus Christ his death and resurrection has given us a way to be justified by faith in you, to be forgiven of our sins, no longer slaves to sin or to fear, but we are children of the living King. So Lord, bless us as we continue to rush to hush. Let all the earth be silent before our holy God. So we exalt you this morning. And we know that you are a living God, and we look to you. Help us in our weakness. Help us to cast down our idols in Jesus' name this morning.